All right, let's pray. Father, I'm grateful for your um, continued goodness to us as we dig into your word and as we try to mine it for the diamonds you have for us. I pray that as we, um, we look now at what it means to be a creature created in your image um, in this world that you've created to communicate yourself, um, that we'd have help. Uh, we have limitations. We have l- mental limitations. We have spiritual and emotional limitations, bodily limitations. We're limited in so many ways which means we need divine assistance so that our eyes are open to see everything you want us to see in the Bible and in your world. So I pray for your help, and I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so thus far, we've, um, we've talked about God as he is in himself, and then we talked to uh, the Trinity, triune God of glory, and then we've talked about God as he is in relation to creation. He's the author of this story. And then in the most recent sessions, we've been talking about um, that creation is communication. He's present in everything, and he's everywhere speaking and communicating and telling us about himself. And so we want to be attentive. And now in in these next two sessions, I want us to look at um, what it means to be a creature. What is our role? So we've talked about what the world is saying, the heavens are declaring. Now, what are we, and how do our limitations affect... um, affect our ability to see and hear and know him in the world. So I'll begin with a few quotations again um, that I think are really important. And some of the, the, the first one especially, I think, matters a lot at, at, as we continue to think about how to avoid the false guilt that can plague us whenever we enjoy the things of earth. Um, this quote here is, is huge. There is no good, says Lewis, trying to be more spiritual than God. There's no good trying to be more spiritual than God. Or again, uh, stressing this idea of it's not just on the big big times, the the, the, uh, big occasions that we have to be attentive to God speaking to us, but in everything, Lewis says, we, or at least I, shall not be able to adore God on the highest occasions if we have learned no habit of doing so on the lowest. The little things. At best, our faith and reason will tell us that he is adorable, but we shall have not found him so, not have tasted and seen. And so as we saw yesterday, you can't know that wisdom is sweet unless you've tasted honey and known that it's good and sweet. And you can't know that God is uh, good if you've not tasted and seen other things that are good and that reflect him. So with that, let's dive in um, to where we are here. So the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, out of love for and delight in his own fullness— freely chose to create this world, and then as a uh, fitting, narratival communication of his glory. Those are fancy words. Let me just unpack those real quick. It's a fitting communication of glory because infinite wisdom conceived and directed it. It was his idea. This world was his idea. So it's good. Uh, It's narratival because the shape of the world, as we saw a few sessions ago, is a story. This world is a story a sequence of events with a beginning, middle, and end. And it's communication because God speaks it into existence and speaks himself through it at every point in all of its glory because the creator and author is the Lord of glory. So now as we turn to talk about what does it mean for us to be creatures capable of relating to this author in a real way, um, we want to look at the beginning uh, at Genesis chapter 1. So um, in Genesis uh, Glorious text. Genesis 1 to 3 is one of those passages that you should spend your life reflecting again and again. You'll see more every time. Um, So God creates the world from nothing, and then he begins to assemble and divide creation into its various spheres. So uh, he looks at the light, he looks at the earth and the seas, he divides the waters from the waters, um, he causes the dry land to come up, creates the vegetation, fills it with creatures, big and small, and after he's all done, after, after he does each one, he says, Behold, it was good. God saw that it was good. He approves of his work. So he's looking at what he's doing in creation, and he's approving of it. He's happy with it. He recognizes his own wisdom and power and creativity and artistry and goodness and kindness in the things that he has made. And uh, and when he's finished with this work, after all of his created um, activity, he, um, he looks at everything he's made, and in verse 31 of chapter 1, he says, God saw everything that he had made, all of it, and behold... It was very good. Adds that uh, extra note. He surveys this world. So just pause and just 
consider what this means. God looks at the world of matter, of time, uh, of trees and branches, of seas and waves, of signs, seasons, days, years, and he has one reaction. It's very good, exceedingly good, over the top good. Uh, exclamation point good. Okay? Spike the football, touchdown dance good. That's how good the world is. It's finite, okay? it's not infinite like he is. It's temporal, it's not timeless like he is. It's limited, and it's very, very good. So what this means is God is the true materialist, C.S. Lewis said. He likes matter. He invented it. Which means we ought not think that there's something wrong with the stuff of the world because it was God's idea to make it. It, it, means, um, it doesn't mean that the material world's all there is. But it does mean that the material world is in some very real sense spiritual. How could it not be, right? It was made by God who is a spirit. And so it has to in some way be deeply and profoundly spiritual. So creation is good because God made it and approves it and deems it so. But we can say more because the Bible says more. So now we're going to turn from Genesis 1 to Genesis 2 to look at us, to look at the creation of man. So in Genesis 1, we get this kind of whole sweep of, of things. And now in Genesis 2, he zeroes in and says, let's, let's think about the creation of man and woman. So I want you to notice a few things here in Genesis 2, verse 5 to 9. Uh, when no bush of the field was yet in the land, and no small plant of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the land, and there was no man to work the ground, and a mist was going up from the land and was watering the whole face of the ground, then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And I just want you to notice a few features of human existence, of, of created existence that show up here. First, this word, when. It's time. There's time involved here. We're temporal creatures. We exist in time. And then, uh, formed, formed the man from dust, from the ground. We're made of stuff, of matter. We're physical. We're bodily, okay? We're not spirits. We're uh, merely, we're, we also have bodies made from dust. And then he put the man uh, whom he had formed in the garden, meaning we have location. Right? So we exist in time. We exist in space. We exist in bodies. And um, this means that we're not, um, e notice that the, the, um, the physical comes first. God formed the man from the dust of the ground and then breathed into him the breath of life. So some religions teach that, that uh, we are spirits sort of imprisoned in bodies. That's not the biblical picture. We're not spirits imprisoned in bodies. We are embodied souls and ensouled bodies. They go together. In fact, the separation that we experience at death is foreign to us. It's, it's something alien to our design. That's not the way it's supposed to be. We're supposed to be body and soul together. That's what it means to be human. And so here's the simple point I want to make from that passage, that time, uh, space, and bodies um, means that temporality, limitation, finitude are not defects to be overcome. Okay. Our existence in time and space and in bodies is not a bug to, in God's mind. It's not something that he has to fix. It, he's not trying to work the kinks out because you exist in time and in space. It's a feature. He thinks that's the best way to do it. If he'd have, he, he could have created, you know, um, uh, you know, purely spiritual beings. He has angels. And he said, no, I, I want to do something better than that. I want to make beings with bodies who exist in time. He's not ham, which means he's not hamstrung by our bodies. He's not like, gosh, I really wish I could communicate spiritual truth to them, but their bodies get in the way. And time, oh, time is just this big problem I've got to solve. It's not the way God thinks at all. He knows our frame. He remembers we are but dust, Psalm 103. He made us this way, and he thinks it's a grand idea. So as we think about what it means to be a creature, we first have to recognize the limitations we experience. You can't do everything all the time. You have limited power, limited resources. God thinks, yeah, that's the way I made you. That's, that's good. That's very, very good. So that's number one. Next, keep moving in the story. Genesis 2, 15 to 17. So the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, 
You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Now, we often focus on the, the prohibition here, the, the negative command, don't eat from that tree. But notice what the first command is. Okay, there's, so the Lord commanded them. What's the command? You may surely eat of every tree. That's the first order from God. It's not don't eat that one. The first one is eat from every one. That's the first command. The, this is the lavishness of God in providing for our physical needs. So uh, in, earlier in the chapter, we're told that God made every tree, uh, this is chapter 2, verse 9, every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. So it looks good and it tastes good. And now we're told that they're all for us. I made them, they're beautiful and they taste good. And guess what? I have a command for you. Eat from them, all of them, except one. So one pastor says, this is one no in a world full of yes. One no in a world full of yes. And um, th- this, is, this is God, he's coming to us and he's saying, look, look at every tree that bears fruit. Look at it. It's beautiful. Aren't they beautiful? That, that's why I gave you eyes, Adam. That's why I gave you eyes so you could see things like that. Wait until you taste them. It'll be like a party in your mouth. Okay? They're so good. They're, they're, they're delicious. Wait, th- I gave you a tongue so that you could experience. Wait till you do it. And guess what? You can eat from every one of them. All of them are yours for food, except one. There's, there's one no. One no. But this is a world full of yes, Adam. It's a world full of yes. And so eat, drink, be merry. This is the kind of God we worship. This is the kind of father we have. So that's, that's what we see here in this passage. If, and so what I want to do is take the... Um, divine endorsement of sight and taste. They're good for the sight, and they're, or they're beautiful to sight and good to taste. And I want to just see if I could do this, expand it and say, let's take that as a representative of all sensible pleasures, meaning pleasures that we receive through the senses. So that's sight, sound, smell, taste, touch. There's five senses. Any pleasure that we receive through the senses God says, they're all for you. In the garden, he says, they're all for you. Okay? They're, it provided they're enjoyed within the boundaries he established. Don't eat from that one. Provided they're enjoyed in that way, God says, it's all for you. That's why, that's why I made you the way I made you, and that's why I gave you all of these things, so that you would enjoy them. He could have made, like I said, he could have made an immaterial world populated by spirits, and he thought stomachs and tongues were better. That's a better deal. He, every combination of sour, sweet, bitter, savory, and salty that, that the chefs on the Food Network can come up with, every combination, right? All that is, is uh, them discovering all the ways that God can communicate himself through taste, okay? All these different combinations of uh, uh, sweet and savory and sour, and all, they bring it all together and they say, there, here, what, what's that? That's God saying, this is what I'm like. This is what I'm, I'm guessing it's gonna take a while. Right, to figure out the fullness of what God is like. So this means um, that there's this symphony of glory that sounds through taste, right? Through this corn salsa and Sour Patch Kids, through sweet tea, rye bread, the kind that fills your belly up. That's symphony of glory that God is communicating to us. It's, it's so that we taste and see that the Lord is good, so that when Jesus comes along and says, I am the bread of life, we go, I know what bread is, and I know what hunger is. He who comes to me will not hunger. He who believes in me will not thirst. If we didn't have those senses, think about how impoverished our vocabulary would be for talking about God. We couldn't hunger for him because we wouldn't know what hunger is. We couldn't thirst for him because we wouldn't know what thirst is. God said, I'm going to give you stomachs so that you can know me. So fill your belly and go, oh, that's what fullness feels like. Empty your belly, be hungry and know that's what your soul is like without me. This is what God is doing for us. He thinks that this is a grand idea. Without it, we would be massively, massively unable to relate to him. We'd have no mental, no emotional, no spiritual framework for engaging with him. So what that means is the provision of food and drink and all the senses that we have to receive them bodily, they're a gift from God um, and a testimony to his approval of our limitations. Those are all limitations, but they're good limitations. But he's not done. 
He's not done with approving of our limitations. Look at this. Next verses. Genesis 2, 18 to 20. The Lord God said, it's not good that the man should be alone. I'll make him a helper fit for him. Now out of the ground, the Lord God had formed every beast of the field, every bird of the heavens, and he brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all livestock and to the birds of the heavens, every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. So five and a half days we get, God saw that it was good. Now here in the middle of day, uh, day six, not good. Not good. It's not good that man should be alone. God sees something missing. He sees a gap. Uh, there's, there's something missing in my creation and I'm going to fill it. Now, very basic observation. When God says to Adam, it's not good for man to be alone, it would have been entirely inappropriate for Adam to look back at God and say, what do you mean alone? I have you. It would have been very pious sounding. right? I have you, God. I have you. What do you mean? I'm, it's not good that man should be alone. I have you. That's true. He did. And entirely beside the point, God's the one who says, it's not good for you to be alone. So Adam's solitude even with God as his uh, companion and as his fellowshipping partner in the garden, is a defect, according to God. And God in his goodness acts to remedy it. And, And that's important. God's the one who acts. God's the one who meets the need. God is the one who gives life and breath and everything else, including a helper, including companionship. But this is important, so important. God has designed us so that he would meet some of our needs through other people. He will meet some of our needs through people. He won't meet them directly with himself. That's not the way he made us. He made us so that needs would be met through people. So you shouldn't dispute with him at that point. You shouldn't say, oh, we can do better than that. That's trying to be more spiritual than God. And Lewis is right. We shouldn't try to do that. There's no virtue in trying to, out, to be more holy than he is. We think somehow that we can out-holy God. We shouldn't do that. Wisdom, infinite wisdom said, you know what, if I'm going to communicate the fullness of my presence, my satisfying presence to them, I'm going to do it through other people. His wisdom, his infinite wisdom said that is the way to do it. Notice that word too, that word, um, uh, Adam, there's not found a helper. I'll make a helper fit for him, suitable for him some translations. Um, God's not just going to leave it up to, you know, any old companion, right? So um, elephants may be impressive, but they're not a good fit, okay, right? So uh, bunnies, very cute, not good companions. Dogs, man best, dog, man's best friend, but God can do better than loyalty and slobber. He, he, can, he can improve on this. And notice in the text, if there's not a helper found for Adam, like if he, can't, if he looks on the animal kingdom and it's Adam's like, no, 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 no companion here, no partner here in this work that you've got for me. What's God going to do? He'll build one. I will build you a companion. So that's the next passage. Keep reading here. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, he took out one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Um, God puts Adam into a deep Death-like sleep, right? Deep sleep. So Adam dies, okay? And while he's in that sleep, Adam loses something. Right? This rib gets ripped out of him. And then he awakes to this stunning reality that he hadn't lost anything at all, okay? This was better. This was fitting. This exceeded all expectation. He was, he, it's Adam dies and he's raised up from one degree of glory to another, and, and the glory of this moment isn't lost on Adam. Like he doesn't, it's not like he misses it. He's totally dialed in to what God just did. Genesis 2.23 are the first recorded human words in the Bible. This is the first time Adam speaks to us that we hear, right? He, he named the animals earlier, but this is the first time we hear his voice. And so let's just think about it. This is a pretty big moment in the history of the world. Very first human words. What is Adam going to say? Well, he's a poet. Right? That's why if you look in your Bible, it's probably that this passage is offset. Verse 23 is going to be set off as a poem. Well, what's this poem? The man said, This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Now think about this for a minute. Here we are, first recorded words, 
and it's a poem. It's a hymn of praise whose object is another creature. Just let that, okay. This isn't idolatry. It, it can't be idolatry. This is the garden we're talking about here. This is nothing but perfect, perfect love for God here. And, and yet, what erupts out of Adam's mouth isn't first about God, it's first at last. At last. He, he, God brings her, her, this woman, and he's just like, this is, this is amazing. Without a shred of idolatry, he composes an ode to her, about her. You come from me, but you're not me. Your bones were built from my bones. Your flesh was cut from my flesh. We are alike, but we're different. We're the same, but we're sundered. God has torn me in two so he could put me back together again. He's removed from me a rib from my side so that he could give it back to me with interest. He's divided me from myself so that I could be reunited with myself in a more glorious complementary union. What, what name is going to capture that? Well, okay, I'm Adam, made from the Adama, the dust from the ground. You shall be called Isha, woman, because you were taken out of Ish, man. Adam's not turning away from love for God here. Adam's not saying, ah, forget about God. This is what love for God looks like when it meets one of his glorious gifts. This is what love for God looks like when it meets one of his gifts. He's found a wife. Adam found a wife. He's found a good thing, and this is favored from the Lord, and he's got to express it. And so this is like Lewis's tiny theophany. He meets that moment of pleasure and delight, and it's like God is touching him with his hand and saying, how good it is, how good it is. Embrace it. Taste and see how good she is so that you can taste and see how good I am. He, saved, he chases the, the, the beam back to the source, back to the sun, savoring the gift for the sake of the giver. So that's what we see. We've got, now we've got so physical needs, sensible needs, and God says those are good. All those, those sorts of pleasures, those are designed to communicate myself to you. Relational, I don't, I don't think we're just to limit this passage to marriage. Okay, it's not, this, that's what the, the, the main purpose of the passage is to describe origin of marriage, purpose of marriage, right? But companionship, all people need companionship, whether you're married or not. No one is solitary in the way that Adam was solitary. Everybody's born into a family. You're born again into a new family, the church. Everybody needs friends. Everybody, we all need companionship, and God has designed us this way um, so that we would have it because he wants to meet our needs through it. So now, that's one purpose of the gifts. Gifts were given for our enjoyment. It's all for you. It's all for you. Enjoy them. Enjoy each other and enjoy all the good things that I've supplied. But that's not the only purpose for the gifts. In order to see the others, um, we, need to, we need to take a minute and talk about what it means to be made in God's image. And there's lots of debates about this, about what it means that we're made in the image of God and the likeness of God. Uh, I'd like to suggest that there are three dimensions, that, that to be made in God's image is... Um, related to three callings that we have as human beings. Three things that we're called to do and to be in the world. And the first is this. We're called to be obedient priests. I've written there, homo adorans, which means worshiping man. Okay, so you've probably heard homo sapiens. We'll get to that one in a minute. That's wise man. That's what the technical scientific name for the human species is. Well, let's start actually more fundamental. Homo adorans. We're made to worship. We're obedient priests. Why do I say that we're priests? How do I get that? I think that's in Genesis. And uh, here's where I get it. In 2.15, we're told, the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. Now, those are very common words in the Hebrew Bible. They show up a lot, but they don't show up a lot together. When they're paired like this, they only show up in a very few select places. And let me show you one of the other ones. In Numbers chapter 3, and again in chapter 18, we're told, bring the tribe of Levi near and set them before Aaron the priest that they may minister to him. They shall keep guard, that's the same word, over him and over the whole congregation before the tent of meeting as they minister, that's the same word. They shall guard all the furnishings of the tent of meeting and keep guard, that's the same word, over the people of Israel as they minister at the tabernacle. So 
these words, work and keep, or guard and minister, show up together very rarely, but when they do, it's in a priestly context. It's what Levites are supposed to do in the tabernacle. It means that they're to work and to keep, to guard and protect. That's what Levites did, right? The, anything unclean shows up, deal with it. That's your job. That's your task. And so this means that when Adam is called to work and keep the garden, he's called to guard and protect and worship God in his sanctuary. The Garden of Eden is like a sanctuary. It's where the presence of God dwells. Just as God dwelt in the tabernacle, later in the temple, so also God dwelt in the garden. And so uh, this is our calling as human beings. What does it mean to be made in his image? Hear God's word, obey God's word, worship God rightly, guard his holy presence from unclean encroachments, like say a dragon shows up and starts lying. That's something you're supposed to protect and guard and keep the garden. That's the first dimension of our, what it means to be made in God's image. We're obedient priests. Second, homo sapiens, wise kings. Where do we see this? Well, Genesis 1.28, God blessed them. God said to them, be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And this phrase, again, shows up throughout the Bible, and it regularly refers to what kings do. So uh, the, the Davidic king, may he have dominion from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. So exercising dominion as a wise king over God's kingdom, as God's sort of vice president, as his vice regent, um, that's part of our calling as, what it, as human beings. And here in Genesis 1, it's not just... Um, have dominion over the little garden. It's be fruitful, multiply, and fill. Subdue the earth. So here, if you've got a garden that's like a, the sanctuary, now it's, and then expand it. Expand this garden so that the earth is filled with uh, image bearers just like the water covers the sea. So now we're called to be obedient priests and wise kings. We're to be a royal priesthood, a kingdom of priests. You've probably, that should trigger some things as that shows up again and again throughout the scripture. So that's the, that's the second calling we have. So obedient priest, wise king, and the last one, homoloquens, or speaking man. We're called to be faithful prophets. So Adam, out of the ground, the Lord God had formed every beast and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. God doesn't name stuff. God names the sky, Right? In Genesis chapter 1, he names the sky, the land, gives a few names. He names Adam uh, out of the dust of the Adam of the ground, and then he turns it over, and he says, all right, take it from here. I'm going to bring you all the beasts. I'm delegating this task to you. This is what your job is. Go name the world. And whatever, notice, whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. That was its name. So what are we called to be? We're called to be faithful prophets. We're called to speak into the world and reflect what God is like in our speaking as we imitate him in his speaking. So put these together. Our calling is to fulfill our vocation as uh, obedient priests who work and keeps God's sanctuary, as wise kings who have dominion over the earth, God's kingdom, and as faithful prophets who creatively name God's world. That's what it means to be human. That's our calling in the, in the garden. Um, or to, to fill it out a little bit more, we're given a mission. Be fruitful, multiply, fill the world, subdue the earth, exercise dominion over its creatures, cultivate the land, work the ground, keep and guard the garden from all evil. Image God by obediently echoing his words and faithfully naming his world. So we're given this mission in, in the early chapters of Genesis. Adam and Eve have a mission. They have a task. They have a job. Now back to what are gifts for. Gifts aren't just for their enjoyment. They're provision for mission. So now circle back through those two gifts we looked at, those sensible gifts, right? All the, all the food's for you. All these, these fruit trees, they're just all for you, except for that one. All of them are for you. Well, why? Well, because they have a job. Adam's got a task. Fill the world with image bearers. So you're going to need strength. You're, you've been commissioned, Adam, to subdue the earth, to take dominion, and you're going to work the ground, and you're going to protect the garden from evil. To do that, you're going to need strength. You're going to need power and energy to sustain your labor. So, in other words, you're going to need food. Therefore, therefore, eat from every tree. I command you, eat from every tree. You have a mission. So get, so get this. Gifts are for our enjoyment. 
already in your mouth, gifts are provision for mission. But not just the sensible stuff, the sensory pleasures. What about relationship? Well, this isn't hard to think about, I don't think. Um, It's going to be very difficult for Adam to be fruitful (laughs) and multiply and fill the earth as a bachelor. Okay? First comes love, then comes marriage, then comes the baby in the baby carriage. That's how it goes, which means if Adam is going to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth, he's going to need help. He's going to need lots of help. So God gives a wife so that together this couple can populate the earth with God's praise as it echoes from their children. So again, why does God give us relationships? Not just physical pleasures, but God gives us relational gifts so that we can fulfill the mission that he's called us to. So, so that's what we see in these early chapters of Genesis. Gifts are given for our enjoyment. Gifts are given as provision for mission. Now, that raises a, a certain kind of question. It means that these gifts are valuable. They have, a, they have real value to us. But we need to think a little bit about what kind of value they have. So, um, so let's start by asking it this way. Um, some people like to, to say um, that creation has intrinsic value. So do we have that? Is that the right way to talk? You ever maybe heard people talk that human beings have inherent value or intrinsic value? And uh, that's a tricky question because it could mean one of two things. On the one hand, you might mean uh, if we have inherent value, it means we have autonomous value, meaning value that exists by itself independently from God. And if that's what you mean by inherent value, then the answer is no. Nobody has that. There is no autonomy. There is no, we're all dependent upon God. Therefore, we can't have independent value. Does that, that make sense? But if we mean, do we have permanent value, real value, value that's essential to who we are? The answer is yes. Why? Because God values us. So, and this matters. This really matters. We are valuable because God values us, not God values us because he finds that we're independently valuable just on our own. He's the one who gives value. We have therefore derived an inherent value. It's derived because God gives it to us. He values us and we're valuable, but it's really in us because when God gives something, he really gives it and he keeps on giving it and he keeps on giving it so that we um, retain this value. He says, let us make man and it's very good. Therefore, we have this value. We have derived inherent gift value and not autonomous value. Now, what that means, here, why, why did I bring that up? Well, um, because this is getting at this problem we have. If we, if we have God, who's infinitely valuable, and then we have creation, which has some kind of real, permanent, inherent value derived from God, now we've got a, this challenge of, well, how am I supposed to relate them? How do I value this so that it doesn't threaten this? How do I value the gifts so that they don't become idols, for example? Um, so I want to introduce a fancy term, fancy theological term, but every one of you will know what it means as soon as I describe it. I guarantee it. It's this fancy term that philosophers throw around called the principle of proportionate regard. It's very, you can impress your friends with that at parties. What does that mean? Um, well, it simply means we should value, esteem, regard things in proportion, that's proportionate, to their value, nature, and worth. So you value things, according to their value. And every one of us operates on some kind of scale like this, okay? We all know that if a husband values his hobbies more than his family, something's wrong. Why? They're worth more than the hobbies. If a mother values the cleanliness of her home more than the well-being of her children, something's wrong. They're more valuable than it is. So we all operate this way. In fact, the Bible teaches us to operate this way. When Jesus says, are not two sparrows sold for a penny? And not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father, but even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore, you are of more value than many sparrows. What's he saying? There's a scale of values. Some things are valued a whole lot, and some things are valued only a little bit. And in comparison to sparrows, you guys are heavier. Okay? You put, the, you put sparrows and people on a, on a scale and God says, you're more valuable. The, the Old Testament law is built on this. This is why there's different punishments for different crimes. Some crimes are worse. Like, um, people are more important than property. So if you steal something, the punishment is less harsh than if you kill somebody 
Our legal system operates this way. We all have a scale of values where we say, this is more valuable than this, is more valuable than this. So people over property, uh, God over everything else, right? That's, that's a part of our scale of value as, as Christians. And so if we operate this way, this is the question it raises. This is the problem it raises, okay? You can maybe see where I'm going here. You've got God is infinitely valuable. Creation is finite, limited, has all these limitations, so it's not infinitely valuable. If you're supposed to value things according to their value, it means you should value God infinitely. This is where that subtle guilt begins to gnaw at us a little bit. Um, so, um, so let me say it again. If we believe that we should value things according to their value, however valuable they are, that's how much my heart should feel for them. And if we know God has infinite value, everything else has limited value, then we begin to feel that if we're going to be faithful Christians, there's got to be an infinite gap between our love for him and our love for those things. Here's how the logic works. Um, our enjoyment of God must infinitely surpass our joy in our family. And we know, based on our experience, that it doesn't. We know that we feel something for our family. Right? I, I really do delight in them, and therefore, I'm not, there's not an infinite gap. They register on the scale, and therefore, oh no, I don't love God enough, and now I feel guilty, and it just hangs on me, hangs on me, hangs on me. Is that, is that the right way to think? So let's put, the, let's put it in a logical form. So God has infinite value. We should value things according to their value. That's the principle of proportionate regard. Therefore, conclusion, we should value God infinitely. Now that is airtight logic, but is it biblical? Is it biblical? Um, here's, here's why this, this becomes a really practical problem. Um, because what it can lead us to do is as we begin to feel this, it leads us to distance ourselves from earthly delights in the name of holiness. If we begin to feel, I want to be a faithful Christian. If I'm going to love God rightly, I can't love my kids that way. I can't delight in them or I can't delight in my wife or my husband. I can't delight in these things in the way that my heart erupts and wants to because it, that's, a, that's an assault on the infinite value of God. And we probably never articulate that fully. Like I know that it's not something you maybe thought, but it's something you've probably felt. Like I really had this moment of joy. Oh no. So um, now I think there, now I think this logic is airtight, but I think that there's some problems here. One of which is, um, is, is the, we'll, we'll talk about this in future sessions, is the only way to look at this is like God on one side of the scale and gifts on the other side of the scale. Like, is that the right way to think? Just put them in scale and then weigh them? Is that the only way? Is, is there another way to think? I think there is. We'll talk about that in the future. But for now, what I want to do is this. Um, should we value God infinitely? Well, Here's the problem. As creatures, we never do anything infinitely. That was the whole point of the first part of the session here. We never do anything infinitely. To be a creature, as we saw, was to be finite and limited. Therefore, you don't have an infinite capacity to do anything, including love God. You'll never do that. If you try to love God infinitely, is to place upon yourself an impossible burden. And the impossibility is not owing at this point to sinfulness, like you have a sinful heart. It's simply owing to you're a creature. You're not God, so you don't do anything infinitely. And I've been trying to argue from the Bible that that's not a defect. God's not bothered by the fact that you're not infinite and therefore can't love him infinitely. So here's, here's the conclusion. If failure to love God infinitely is a sin, then we are condemned not as sinners fundamentally, but as creatures. And this world is not very good. God has built in a defect that can never be overcome. Okay, so I want to keep working on this. How should, what do we do with this airtight logic then? Well, let's, let's, instead of thinking about loving God infinitely, let's think about what the Bible actually calls us to. And what the Bible actually calls us to is love God supremely. So Exodus 23 to 4, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. And that word before me there is really in my presence. 
which means this is a call for exclusive worship, or I'm saying supreme love. Exclusive worship or supreme love. So your call as a, as a human being is not love God infinitely, but love him above everything else. He's at the top. Supreme love for God, but not just supreme love. Greatest commandment, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and all your strength. So not just supreme love, full love. He's at the top and he's got it all. And that's not quite the same as infinite, is it? Because all you, it just means whatever you've got as a creature, full. Okay. It doesn't mean infinite. You don't have infinite capacity. You, it's, you, you don't have an infinite bucket. You've just got a limited bucket, but it just needs to be full of God, love for God. But here's the interesting thing. We all know this, that full love for God can't, uh, doesn't cancel out love for neighbor because the very next thing Jesus says is, love your neighbor as yourself. So, so somehow, supreme love for God, full love for God, and real, authentic, deep love for neighbor have to fit together. So we'll explore that more uh, as we go forward. So we've got supreme love for God, we've got full love for God, and then I'm gonna add one more, increasing love for God. May your love abound more and more in knowledge and all discernment. May the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all, and I would just add, including God. May your love for him get bigger and bigger and bigger. So now you've got uh, supreme love, full love, and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger as your heart expands to love him fully. And this, this is a different, um, this is a different uh, uh, way of, of viewing it. Um, because if you say that that kind of love, supreme, full, and expanding, doesn't cancel out love for neighbor, then now we're free to see how, how do they relate? Well, love for neighbor is what love for God looks like when it meets neighbor. Love for neighbor is what love for God looks like when it meets neighbor. Just like delight in Eve is what love for God looks like when it meets Eve. So keep working that principle out. What about um, grateful enjoyment of fish tacos is what love for God, supreme love for God, full love for God, expanding love for God looks like when it eats fish tacos. Robust pleasure in ultimate frisbee is what supreme and full and expanding love for God looks like when it's playing ultimate frisbee. Delight in people, love for people is what supreme and full and expanding love for God looks like when it meets people. So we don't pit these against each other as though we have to choose. We say, if we love God in this way, then when we meet people or when we meet things that are communicating him, we love them for his sake as expressions of our supreme and full love for God. And now, here's the thing that this does, this, especially this idea of expanding. Edwards um, gives us an alternative to loving God infinitely, since we can't do that. He says, there are many reasons to think that what God has in view in an increasing communication of himself through eternity, that's why he made the world, he wanted to communicate himself, as we've seen. What does God have in view is an, increase, an increasing knowledge, love, and joy in God. Okay, that's, that's what God has to you, an increasing one, forever. Now, um, what that means um, is that the, put it this way, you're a creature, you're finite, and you're limited. And yet, that logic that God is infinitely value, valuable, therefore I should love him and value him infinitely, feels so compelling. Well, the only way for a finite creature to fulfill an infinite obligation is to fulfill it fully, supremely, and increasingly forever. So, so take that infinite obligation that's like up here, and if you just, instead of going up, you just extend it forever, you'll get there. Just take, it'll take eternity for you to love God to the degree that he's worthy to be loved. That's how long it will take for you as a creature, a limited, finite creature, because for all eternity, what's he gonna be doing? Expanding your heart, expanding your mind, opening you up so that you can love him more and more and more and more. And as if you were able to take eternity and look at it all at once, like God can, he'd say, that fulfills an infinite obligation. You are loving me the way you ought to love me as the infinitely valuable creator of all things. 
Now, is that, is that biblical? This idea of an increasing forever love for God, is that in the Bible? Well, John 17, which we looked at yesterday, we'll, we'll finish here. I don't ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they may be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Now, I, I want you to think, think about that passage, this idea of we are going to be one with God in the way that the Father and Son are one. And here's what Edwards comments on this passage. It's to be considered that the more those divine communications, those communications of God to us, increase in the creature, so our knowledge of God, love for God, joy in God, the more, more that increases, the more the creature, it, becomes one with God. So the, the more you know God, love God, delight in God, the more that gets bigger, the more united, the more one with God you become. Okay? For so much the more is it united to God in love. The heart is drawn nearer and nearer to God. The union with him becomes more firm and close, like we're, we're drawn in and in, further up, further in, further up, further in, into who God is. And at the same time, the creature becomes more and more conformed to God, as we're predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. We're, we're made more and more like him and we're, hearts are getting bigger and bigger so that we reflect him. The image is more and more perfect. So the good that is in the creature comes forever nearer and nearer to an identity with that which is in God. It comes closer and closer and closer. Never gets there. Never gets there, but it gets closer and closer. Um, math people have a really great way of getting this. If you're not a math person, but maybe you remember something from you know, high school geometry, see if you remember what, what this is. I'll try to draw it here. Um, got a little, uh, oops, an axis there. Um, remember when you, this mathematical function that kind of looked like that? It's called an asymptote. And if you remember what an asymptote is, it means that it's this function where this little curved line gets closer and closer and closer to the axis. It gets closer and closer, but it never touches it. It just keeps going up and up and getting closer and closer and closer, but never gets there. That's what, that's what Edward is talking about. Your love for God, your heart is getting bigger and bigger and getting closer and closer to what God's heart is like, but it never gets there. You always stay a creature. You always stay finite, but you're just chasing the infinite. You're, you're just, you're, your mind's growing. Your heart's growing. You're just, you're expanding and expanding as God reveals more and more of himself to you and you're getting closer and closer and closer, but you never get there because it takes forever. So here's what Edward says. In the view, therefore, of God, who has a comprehensive prospect, meaning he views that increasing union and conformity through eternity. He sees all of it at a glance. He can do that, unlike you and me. That it's an infinitely strict and perfect nearness, conformity and oneness. For it will ever, forever come nearer and nearer to that strictness, meaning that tightness, and perfection of union which there is between Father and Son, so that in the eyes of God, who perfectly sees the whole of it, it must come to a fulfillment of Christ's request in John 17, that they may be one as you, Father, are in me, and I am in you. That prayer will get answered, but it will take eternity for it to be answered, which means it never will be answered. Glorious, glorious paradoxes in, in the Bible. So this is what we've seen. What does it mean to be a creature? It means that we're finite, limited. We're temporal, we're bodied, embodied. We're we're Finite, temporal, limited, but very good. And we have our needs met directly by God in some, ways, some cases and also through the manifold gifts that he supplies. We're God's priests, his kings, his queens, his prophets, and he has lavished us with gifts beyond our imagining, both for our glad-hearted enjoyment, gifts are given for our enjoyment, and for the fulfillment of his great and glorious mission. We are valuable because he values us, and we ought to value him according to his value and other things according to their value, but we banish all forms of false guilt that come from being creatures and, and for failing to love God infinitely. Instead, we seek for our love for God to be supreme and full and expanding forever. This is what it means to be human. This is what it means to be created, to be a creature in a world that communicates God at every point. Let's pray. Father, it is liberating. It's hugely liberating to me to know that I don't have to meet an infinite obligation right now. I know it would be impossible for me, and it would be impossible for me to do so in heaven when I'm made perfect, because I'll still be limited. I won't have infinite 
an infinite heart to love you. And so it's hugely liberating to me to know that your word calls me not to love you infinitely, but to love you with everything I've got and to love everything that comes my way for, you, for your sake. Those impossible obligations mean that we fail again and again and again and it leads to incurable guilt, which leads us to sin even more because we think, what's the point? I'm never gonna do it. I can never, I can never love God in the way he wants me to. I never love him enough, whatever that means. And so I'm so grateful that you liberate us from these by saying, I don't, I don't want infinite from you. I want full from you. I want supreme love from you. I want increasing and expanding love for you. And I am committed to giving you gifts, to lavishing you with salvation, to lavishing you with every good thing so that you can grow up into the fullness of God, so that you can see me in everything and hear me in everything and smell me and taste me and, and, and sense me, experience me in everything that I've made and all of the creation that I've given you. You can know me and you've given us yourself, Lord. And so we thank you and we pray that you would help us to receive it gladly and to then fulfill the mission that you've given us. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen.